I was somewhat hesitant to go back and start doing older seasons of Drag Race, like Season 9 for this series, because I was under the impression they were going to be less rigged. And you know what? Season 9, for the most part, is pretty damn fair. But as this series has progressed, it's become less about ripping apart the moments of riggery and instead discussing the big story arcs of the season and how those arcs lead to the production decisions that may or may not be rigged. So going into this video, at first I was like, wait, what am I going to talk about? Yeah, there are some suspicious placements, but it's not like later seasons where basically every episode has some type of head scratching moment. But then I realized, oh, there is still plenty to discuss. This might be the strongest cast the show has ever seen. Basically, every single one of them are still huge names in the drag race scene. And they delivered one of my favorite seasons of the show, and the season that really upped the production value, the level of drag, and the definition of drag on the show. There are so many interesting things I cannot wait to dissect about this season, so without further ado, let's dive into the riggery of Season 9. After the gigantic success of All Stars 2 and the permanent move to VH1, there were a lot of eyes on this season. It still remains the most viewed season of Drag Race, with the premiere drawing just under a million viewers. So to say expectations were high was an understatement. And VH1 understood the damn assignment. They put their entire produce into this season and it shows. The first major change is just the caliber of queens that they cast. No shade to earlier seasons, but you could always kind of tell who wasn't going to last very long or who was new to drag. This season was absolutely stacked with lots of different forms of drag, ages, perspectives. You had alternative queens like Sasha Valore and Nina Bonina Brown, seasoned vets like Trinity Taylor, Peppermint, and Charlie Hydes, social media icons like Pheromone, Aja, and Valentina. Even the early outs like Kamora Black and James Mansfield were polished and had perspectives to their drag. This is truly the greatest cast we have ever had, in my opinion. Everybody but Charlie, no shade, has truly remained in the popular canon of the series. And we've seen two more queens come back and win All-Stars, getting their own crowns. Coming in, I definitely think most of the queens were on pretty even playing fields. Aja, Peppermint, and Farah definitely were more well-known than the others, especially Peppermint. She was one of the first drag queens I had ever knew about before even watching this show because I, I remember watching her in Sherry Vine's Lady Gaga, I think it was Telephone parody. And I know that they did other videos together that I watched before I had ever even known what Drag Race was. An interesting storyline that pops up a lot this season is the social media queen narrative that Farah and Aja both get. And as far as I can remember, Kim Chi was the first queen to really get any type of recognition for how popular she was on Instagram. And because of this, Kim is definitely highlighted very early on as a major threat and a major force on that season. This season, though... The narrative is more about how being a social media queen does not mean you're going to be good at drag race. The discussion about having filters and Photoshop is brought up, and I definitely think Aja coming in with some pretty lackluster makeup had a lot to do with how that direction of the storyline went. I don't think it's shady to say that Aja and Farah were not amazing competitors on season 9. And this storyline of being a social media queen who is lacking performance skills and polish has kind of carried on ever since. Although to be fair, Aja did have performance skills and Farah did have polish. But the fact that they each lacked in one of these areas made them kind of fodder for storylines highlighting this and lots of kind of shady confessionals from other queens pointing it out as well. 
And this is a big part of the first episode, which we can just dive right into. One of the most iconic episodes of the entire series, where the queen of all queens, Lady Gaga, walks into the workroom, and we meet a new batch of 13 queens. Right off the bat, we get a lot of storylines that are already getting highlighted that will take place later in the season. Valentina gets a lot of focus as a baby queen who is also one of the most polished girls in the room. She gets a lot of attention from the other queens who are both kind of overlooking her because she is so new, but also clearly stunned by how gorgeous she is. We get the backstory to Trinity and Eureka's feud outside of the show. So of course we know that's going to pop up later. Kind of like how they did that with Rosé and Olivia in season 13. And that led to a huge arc as well. Oh, wait, never mind. That was just narrative blue balls. Overall though, I would say Sasha, Valentina... Shay, Nina, and Alexis get a lot of attention in this first episode, mostly from the walkthroughs and reactions from the other queens, which makes sense since they are some of the main characters on the season. The first episode is a non-elimination. We see the queens walk two different runways, one based off of their hometown, and the other is a recreation of a Lady Gaga look, and they run the challenge kind of like a pageant. I really liked this episode. I wish they would do something like this on a newer season where, you know, these non-elimination episodes early on are now standard. We've seen so many Rumix challenges be the first episode. Doing another type of pageant where we get to learn more about all of the queens would be super cool. We only get a top three this episode, there are no bottom placements, but we do get to see critiques for every queen, so it's not hard to figure out who would have been in the bottom if there was one. It probably would have looked something like this. The interesting thing about this episode is, for the most part, outside of the top three and the bottom three, every other queen had at least one solid look, and then the other one was meh. Trinity and Alexis had stunning Gaga looks, but their hometown looks were kind of lacking in vision. Charlie had one of the best Gaga looks of the entire night, but her failed reveal for her hometown look kind of dragged down her overall performance. Valentina had one of the best hometown looks, but had a shake-and-go wig and vaguely Gaga look that didn't stack up against some of the other amazing recreations. Same with Shay, amazing hometown, pretty lackluster Gaga. Eureka, Nina, and Sasha each did an amazing job in showcasing their drag and who they are to the judges, which is very important in the first episode. They each had a level of polish and outside-of-the-box ideas that really made them stick out, with Nina's peach look being one of the most innovative looks we have ever seen at this point on the show. As for the bottom three, Pheromone really could have been a standout this episode if she had just done her planned reveal that she showed off in Untucked. And this is very kind of indicative of Farrah's entire run on the season. She holds herself back from really taking it there, which is what leads her to spending most of the season in the bottom three. If she had just shed off that Alejandro robe to reveal the spiky nipple black latex bodysuit, that alone could have put her in the top three. As for Kimura, besides being absolutely stunning, her looks lacked any other perspective. And James, much like we'll see in the next episode, I just don't think was the fully realized James Mansfield we know so well now at this point in her drag career. She has these fun ideas and concepts like camping up Gaga's look and having a fun cow outfit, but she didn't take either concept far enough or to a place that fully makes sense. If we were to see James come back to the show anytime soon, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, I'm confident that she would come back as a completely different queen with much more confidence and conviction than she did on season nine. I think the fact that Nina Bonina Brown wins this episode is really important to her arc on the season. We needed to see just how talented she truly is to be able to handle as much as we get from her later in the season. If she never gets a chance to shine, then her whining and kind of self-sabotage later in the season, it'd be like, okay, bye weirdo. 
But because we see right off the bat that her talent and her potential is off the charts, it makes kind of her downward spiral later in the season devastating to watch. But we'll get there. For the first elimination episode of the season, we have one of the most reviled episodes of the entire franchise, mostly because people really just fucking hate this challenge. Now, I gotta be honest, I hadn't seen this episode in a long time, and going in, I was kind of dreading it. I was like, oh no, this is gonna be bad. But I really think a lot of this episode has been kind of overblown with the hate over time. The narrative that the queens were judged on how many cartwheels and splits and dips they can do isn't really true. The queens that get praised for this episode are the ones who embodied the characters that they were given. For this challenge, the girls were split into two rival cheer squads and each given an adjective, some even a super adjective, to describe the character they're going to be playing on their squad. So for example, Aja is sassy, Nina is assy, Shay is flirty, Sasha is dirty. Some queens like Sasha, Trinity, and Valentina really leaned into their adjectives, and this led them to having some of the best performances of the night, with Shay also being a standout despite not really being that flirty. She was just up there having so much fun. And none of them were really doing that many tricks except for Valentina which was surprising to see, since that's not really what she's known for now. Valentina completely annihilates this entire episode. There's not many episodes where one queen does the best in both the challenge and the runway, but this is one of them. Her wedding dress runway and hilarious character in the cheer challenge fully make her stand out as a front runner and a force to be reckoned with on this cast immediately. And this is where I think the fandom really fell in love with her because she's someone who everyone wants to be. A queen who hasn't been doing drag very long. She's just getting started, but she's already so polished and so clearly is doing what she is meant to be doing in life. The bottoms here are Charlie, Kimora, and James. Now, Charlie and Kimora completely disappear in the performance. But, I mean, Charlie especially, having Boozy as her character really could have camped it up. Lean into not being able to do any of these flips and stuff. Be drunk off your ass, flopping around. We didn't get any of that. James, on the other hand, girl, she was really leaning into the tricks. But instead of giving us gymnast, she was giving us, like, soldier in basic training fighting for her life. It was honestly hilarious. I could watch this part every single day. And her character was snoozy, so why wasn't she, like, falling asleep through all of these moves? I definitely do think that this challenge was dangerous. I mean, as we see, there were several injuries during filming, with Eureka even being sent home because of the injuries that she sustained in this challenge. But I genuinely did like the concept of this challenge. It was fun to watch. It just maybe could have been toned down a little bit to keep the queens a bit safer. Oh! I totally forgot Cynthia Lee Fontaine came back, because I think the season does at some points too. <laughs> so for being a comeback queen, usually we can expect some preferential treatment, tons of screen time, a spot in the top four, but for Cynthia, she is barely a part of the narrative, thrown into the bottom multiple times very early on and sent home by episode six. It's a very different narrative than we are normally used to getting with our comeback queens, and I wish we got to see a little bit more of her before her exit. She's really not in these episodes that much. For the lip sync, we have James versus Kimura to Love Shack by the B-52s. And while it's not the greatest lip sync of all time, it's really not the worst either. James serves camp while Kimura serves sex. Kimura, I think, gets to stay because her performance just had a little bit more control than James's did, which was, you know, it, it's kind of meandering at times. And unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to our camp queen of the season, James Mansfield. Hopefully, we will see you on our television screens again soon. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And the next episode is one of my favorite challenges the show has ever done, Draggly Ever After, where the queens have to conceptualize their own princess character, then give her a backstory, 
and their own sidekick who they have to kind of act a little monologue of on the main stage as well as sewing their own dress to wear on the main stage. There are so many factors that go in and it adds so many layers and areas for creativity to what is essentially just a design challenge. Unlike other multifaceted challenges where sometimes certain parts matter than others, the queens were judged here based on kind of the full package, with the queens in the top having a solid look, a solid princess idea, and a solid sidekick. And the opposite went for the bottom queens. In the top, we have Peppermint, Valentina, and Trinity. Peppermint had one of the coolest concepts and overall looks. Trinity had the funniest sidekick and a really cool reveal to her look. Valentina looked stunning. This is the famous Untucked where Aja reads Valentina for filth, saying she could go out in a fucking diaper and they will tell her she looks like Linda Evangelista. And to some extent, I can see why Aja was upset. Aja's overall look was um, kind of a mess, <laughs> and her character made um, no sense whatsoever, but she made a coat, she made a bra and chaps, she styled a whole wig. Valentina truly is just wearing a bodysuit with some cutouts. Now, Valentina had a really fun sidekick, but her overall character and look I don't think were stronger than some of the other queens like Charlie Hyde, Shea Coulee, Nina Bonina Brown. I don't mean for this to sound shady, I promise, but I remembered Valentina doing better on this season than she actually does. She only gets one more like legit top spot after this episode, but I think she's inflated as such a huge threat from the start and then is never in the bottom until her elimination. So I think it kind of makes her stick out in your mind as doing a bit better than she did. This episode also introduces Pheromone as the iconic whiner of the franchise. Watching her complain and moan and make a huge fuss out of creating a look. And then she literally just comes around the corner and all she did was pin a piece of fabric around her waist and cover a bra. It was such a mood. Farrah probably could have been in the bottom here along with Aja, but Kimora Black's Funky Monkey was so bad that honestly, I think they are interchangeable. And at this point, Farrah had a huge fan base. She hadn't touched the bottom yet. So it makes sense to just throw Kimora back in there and send her home. I actually think the moment Kimora talked about her, oh my gosh, her, her struggle her her devastating journey with not wearing hip pads she was toast <laughs> but as we know kimura is a literal icon watching her on wait what especially seeing her chemistry with Derek barry and mariah paris balenciaga mariah is successful she really is so hilarious and she's been in the casting pool as of late so i wouldn't be shocked to see her turn up for a future all-star season the next episode is the Morning Talk Show Challenge, another iconic episode that has the disaster of Team Trinity. Charlie Hyde's iconic lip sync. So much happens in this episode. This season is the season that just keeps on giving. So the girls break up into teams, and of course, Valentina and Aja are forced to work together after Aja called her the fuck out the last episode. Eureka and Trinity are also put on a team together, and we know that they hate each other's cuts. So Drag Race knows exactly what it's doing, and this episode is when we really start to see the sparks fly. There's not a ton to talk about on Team Good Morning Bitches. Alexis and Pheromone do pretty well as the anchors. It's nice to see Farah have a really good week, both from the challenge and the runway, especially since we're about to have a streak of episodes with her in the bottom. Valentina and Aja definitely do not do well, and they could have been in trouble if the rest of their team didn't slay. Sasha and Shay get their first wins each, and it's just so obvious that they were the funniest of the week. They have such good chemistry. Actually, both of the DIY groups, which were Sasha and Shay, and then Eureka and Nina Bonina Brown, they were the four best of this episode. That's the only downside of episodes where the queens are judged as teams. 
because despite doing the best, Eureka and Nina are just given a safe score on their track record, while queens who didn't do well, like Valentina and Aja, are given a high placement on their track record. This is also the absolute highlight of Miss Cynthia Lee Fontaine on this season. She really shines in this challenge, where she can just let loose and be her funny, wild, random self. As for the other three on her team, they drag down the entire program. Trinity, Peppermint, and Charlie, I don't think understand how live TV works. Peppermint is stumbling over every single word. Trinity has zero personality. And Charlie is married to her cue cards and is as stiff as a board. In all honesty, I think Peppermint probably should have been in the bottom here over Trinity. She could barely get a word out and had the worst runway of the week by far. Trinity was a bit bland, but she got through her lines and she looked absolutely stunning on the runway. But let's be honest, either of them in a lip sync with Charlie Hyde's to I Wanna Go was gonna stay. And it makes for a better storyline and more tension to throw Trinity into the bottom for being the team leader, especially after Eureka kind of called her out for being a bad one on the main stage. I genuinely think this was a great moment for Trinity, though. Not every time you're in the bottom do you come out the other end looking weaker than before. Despite winning the week prior, Trinity, I still don't think, had won people over yet. Queens like Shay, Sasha, Nina, and Valentina had much more praise, but after watching the fire in her while she absolutely obliterated this performance to I Wanna Go, I think it was a big moment for her on the series. And I think to this day, it's still her best lip sync. And she has done a hell of a lot of lip syncs. And I mean, it made all eyes stay on her, I think, for the rest of the season. Charlie goes home in one of the most shocking eliminations of all time. After standing there and not moving an inch for the entire lip sync, it's kind of iconic. She was mother for that. And we move on to one of the worst rusicals, in my opinion, the Kardashian rusical. And we get another iconic moment, which I already know is going to take up probably every single comment under this video, like it has for most of my videos since I started this damn channel, Black China Gate. So let's talk about Miss Nina Bonina Brown. So she's been doing a pretty solid job this entire competition so far. She won the first episode. She was fine in the cheerleading episode. She turned out a fierce look for the design challenge and then had one of the best performances of the week in the morning show. But during her critiques the prior episode, actually before they even begin, we see her crying, and she says it's because she's grateful to be there, but it's edited and presented to us as kind of a red flag and a bad omen for what's to come. And that's probably because Nina's arc throughout the season starts this next episode. Basically, Nina wants to be Black China in the Rusical, but Shay ends up getting the role instead. And she starts to kind of spiral and think that everyone is against her. She's rude to Todrick in the rehearsal and basically acts like a toddler when you take away their binky. But Nina actually does fine in this episode. They put her in the bottom three, but then they don't even really discuss her performance at all. In critiques, they mostly just talk about her attitude and use that as a justification for her placement. But I actually think she did fine. I loved her runway, although Ross gives her a shady remark about how he hates it. I thought she looked good, and I think she was put in the bottom strictly for storyline and almost like a punishment for her behavior this episode. The bottom two, though, is very correct. Pheromone was the embodiment of Go Girl Give Us Nothing, and Cynthia unfortunately just did not know any of the words. As for the tops, we have Peppermint, who did an amazing job as Britney Spears. And then one of the most close calls in Drag Race history between Alexis Michelle and Shea Coulee for the win. I ran a poll on my Insta story, and for most of the day, it was tied 50-50 between who you guys think should have won. 
So let's break this all down. Alexis Michelle kind of has a weird run on season nine. She's very safe for the first couple of episodes. All of her performances are fine. She just doesn't really have that standout moment until this episode. And then she destroys the next episode too. And then for the rest of the season, she really struggles. But for these two episodes, damn, she is good. She plays Kris Jenner in The Rusical, and it is so good. She's on stage for almost the entire Rusical, and if you watch her, even when she's in the background, she is fully in character, always finding tiny moments to do something funny with. It truly is, I think, one of the most amazing Rusical performances ever. But then, her runway. Alexis struggles on more than a few runways, especially later in the season. But this one, it's not even that it's bad. I mean, she looks good. It's just that it's so basic. You hear faux fur, and the first thing you think of is, let me put on a fur jacket. I mean, that's exactly what she went with. You have looks like Nina, who does this Mary J. Blige-inspired look. Sasha does this Russian-inspired look. Trinity does a tribal look. Shay does a club kid look. I mean, Alexis literally just throws on a blue dress and a fur coat and a hat and calls it a day. And I think that is really what held Alexis back for a lot of the competition. Because on a season with so many unique drag styles, her drag lacked a perspective. We had moved on by now from the era of just throwing on a cute dress every week and calling it a day. The fans and the judges both wanted to see unique ideas, perspectives, and styles. And unfortunately, I just don't think Alexis had one fully down at this point. Now, if we look at Shea Coulee, Shea has been killing pretty much the entire season. From her hot dog look in the premiere, a top spot in the cheerleading challenge, creating a stunning dress in the design challenge, and winning the talk show, she had been on a pretty solid trajectory since the start and was one of the main players of the season at this point. In the challenge, she does the bit part of Black China. She's not on the stage for very long, but when she is, everyone else is out of shot and the stage is all hers. And she eats it up. And we know now that Rue and the judges love these kind of small parts that certain queens can make so much bigger than they look on paper. And then on the runway, she gives a super cute look that shows off her vibrant, campy, fun drag style that she had in this era. This definitely could have been a double win, and I don't think anyone would have been mad. But since they did just do a double win the episode prior, it makes sense why they would keep it just one winner, and they choose Shay. Now, the final results of the poll that I did were that Shay won by a very small margin. And I would agree. I think Shay did deserve to win because I don't think the runways should be make or break. I do think they should be there as a tiebreaker. And in this instance, I think Shay and Alexis were both amazing. Neither were the clear standout winner. So in this case, the runway breaks the tie. So Shay wins. So we see Pheromone and Cynthia Lee Fontaine lip sync to the worst song that's ever been a lip sync, and it's not good. Possibly could have been a double sachet moment, but instead we get the most bizarre elimination since Willem on season four. Eureka hurt her knee all the way back in episode two, and it's getting worse and worse to the point now that she is on crutches. And Rue tells her the doctors have told them she has to go home. So Farah and Cynthia are spared and Eureka is sent packing. Obviously, the way that this was all done was for shock value. They knew Eureka was going home. They didn't have to do the whole lip sync, but to make us think it's going to be either Farah or Cynthia and then pull out the shocker that it's neither, it's good TV. It's a good TV moment. I mean, they could have even put Eureka in the bottom and then say, hey, you can't do the lip sync. Doctor said you got to go. I mean, she really couldn't do much in the Rusical other than just stand there and lip sync on her crutches. And she had one of the worst looks of the season, maybe even the series. So it could have been justified to put her in the bottom three and then send her out before the lip sync. But like I said, what we got instead makes better TV 
And our final 10 move on to the Snatch Game. Now, this is a pretty solid Snatch Game. Alexis, Sasha, Nina, Shay, Valentina, and Trinity all do a really good job. Aja is fine. Farah is... <laughs> And then Peppermint and Cynthia are the only ones that I think are fully, like, bad. No riggery this episode, but it is weird seeing Trinity not absolutely demolish Snatch Game since the, I mean, technically three we've seen her do since this season. She has absolutely owned. I think she's mastered Snatch Game, but here she's not there yet. Alexis finally gets her win, doing an amazing Liza Minnelli, and that storyline for her is complete, which means now they can throw her in the bottom until she finally dips out at the final five. This is also the last hurrah for Nina, as we'll see her lip sync three times in the next four episodes before she finally goes home. She's in the top here, and it's nice to see her get one last moment of appreciation from the judges, especially after the harsh criticism she got the last week. This episode, we finally get to see Peppermint lip sync, and it was well worth the wait. Peppermint is one of the fiercest entertainers and performers this show has ever seen, and if it weren't for her and Nina and Aja, the lip syncs on the season would have been fully trash. Let's move on to the next episode, which is 90210, one ho one of the only acting challenges I actually liked. And everybody outside of the bottom two does a good job. Sasha is low for not taking her character further, but I still think she did a good job. I just think everyone else did a little better. So it's an unfortunate placement considering it's her only placement below safe the entire season. Let's talk about the artist formerly known as Trinity Taylor. She gets her second win of the season here in her scene-stealing role of Farrah's mother. And I don't know why, but I got so sick of this narrative they pushed on her that she was the pageant queen who is also silly and could have fun. Because, like, this isn't that much of an anomaly, you know what I mean? Like, Kennedy Davenport already broke this mold on season 7. But for whatever reason, whenever Trinity got critiqued, they had to pound it into our skulls that she's not like the other pageant queens. It's just funny because I don't know, Trinity doesn't really seem to me like a queen who fits into any box. Maybe at this point she did, but I mean, to me, she's a look queen. She's a comedy queen. She's a performer. She can kind of do it all. She is the full package. So to bring it up that she's a pageant queen 50,000 times, it kind of felt like it was diminishing her talents a bit. Trinity was one of my absolute favorites on the season, and it really felt like she just kind of let go and had fun. She gave us drama, confessionals, lip syncs, so many good performances, but she truly stood out when she could just be stupid and silly, like in this episode, and then go serve us a flawless runway after. But you can tell production loved Trinity from the very first episode she appeared in. She is all over this season, and she really does kind of slay the whole thing. Valentina and Shay are given the other two high spots, and I do agree, they both did solid, but if they wanted to, this could have been the week to highlight Farah. She's never been able to stand on the main stage and get good critiques, and I actually think this is her best week ever on the series. She plays Trinity's whiny daughter, and I mean, the role is perfect for her. She and Trinity have great chemistry. She's a solid actor, and her runway for that week was stunning. Of course, Valentina and Shay deserved praise as well. I just thought it would have been nice to give Farah a moment to celebrate her success, especially after a few rough weeks in a row. And as we know, she's the next one to go home after this. In the bottom two, we have Nina and Aja, who just weren't good actors, which, you know, not everyone can act, so... I haven't mentioned Aja in a while, and it's because you literally would forget she was in the season in some of these episodes. They literally almost never showed her. After sending home Kimura in episode 3, she's basically safe up until this episode. She gets no storylines after the whole Valentina arc gets put on pause until the reunion. 
And when this episode starts, you know it's her swan song because she starts getting screen time right away. Aja kind of has a Nina Bonina Brown moment where she doesn't like the role she was given for the challenge and she complains until Shay swaps with her. But then she still does badly and is sent home after a very close lip sync against Nina. Aja really does not get a good edit on this season, unlike Pheromone, who gets the other social media queen edit, but is edited as lovable yet annoying. Aja is edited as spoiled, kind of ungrateful, kind of rude, and who only looks good on Instagram because she has Facetune. It's a very harsh edit, and I'm glad to see that she immediately got to come back and redeem herself both in attitude and competition prowess on All Stars 3. It's one of the most impressive comebacks of all time, considering the short time in between her seasons and just how much she slayed All Stars 3. Another iconic episode is up next, The Roast, which has two of the most iconic performances of all time from Pheromone and Alexis Michelle. <sighs> I wore your favorite color girl. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's so good. Roasts are, are always funny to me because you're either good at them or you're not. And and there's not many like meh roasts. You're either cracking everyone up or people are ready to throw tomatoes at you. Like there's no in between. And as we see, Trinity, Alexis, and Farah completely flop. Farah goes home this episode, and it's a sad elimination. I mean, Farah had kind of become a comfort character to me. I think because she's just so damn relatable, and she's not putting it on for the cameras. I think of all the queens on this season, Farah's kind of the realest one. She's what a lot of people would be if they were on this show. Stressed out, annoyed, and just trying her damn best. She gave so many stunning looks, and despite being in the bottom for four out of the eight episodes she was in, she was so well-liked that they brought her back for All Stars 4. And a lot of that was probably having to do with her absolutely winning the reunion episode. That was her challenge win of the season, let's be real. This also begins Alexis's sharp plateau into the bottom for the rest of the season, Alexis came out of the season with the worst reception from fans. It's not like she even did anything that villainous, but on a season with a ton of likable queens and very little drama, her, Aja, Nina, and Eureka were the only queens to have any type of bad edit, and Eureka and Nina still came out being generally liked by the fandom. And because Alexis made it all the way to the end, basically, Fans like to say she overstayed her welcome, but I have to ask, when would she have gone home then? She beats Farah in the lip sync here, she isn't bottom two worthy in the next two episodes, and then she goes home at top five. Alexis gets a lot of hate to this day, and I hope her next showing on this series helps that. I would love for her to get her own Raja redemption with the fandom once All Stars 8 comes out. The top three of this episode is very clearly Sasha, Shay, and Peppermint, with Nina probably doing the fourth best, but still safe. If we're going by laughs, Sasha got the most, but she also had the longest set. She had over a minute and a half of what we were shown, while Peppermint had a minute and 15 seconds, and Shay had under a minute, 55 seconds. This kind of just felt like Peppermint's moment, Though, I mean, the episode starts off with the queens realizing Peppermint and Farah are the only two queens left without challenge wins. And the sentiment is kind of, you're gonna win or you're gonna go home. And well, that is exactly what happened. Peppermint wins, Pheromone goes home. Peppermint had already had kind of a bumpy ride, while queens like Sasha and Shay and Valentina had been consistently in the top or safe Peppermint had been in the bottom two, bottom three, had a couple weeks in the top, but she had yet to pull out that win, despite being probably the most congenial queen of the season, having such a huge personality, and just a fun aura to her. Like, you can't watch Peppermint without having just, like, a smile on your face. Peppermint's biggest issue had been her runways up to this point, so the fact that she comes out this episode in this roast looking more beautiful than she has ever looked this season, and got to just be her fun, bubbly self on stage, it kind of all came together. 
Whereas Sasha winning would have been great since it had been a minute since her last challenge win, but it wouldn't have been as interesting of a storyline as Peppermint finally getting her win was. The next episode is The Pilots, another one of my favorite challenge prompts. I mean, this is a very cut and dry episode when it comes to placements. Shay and Sasha get their second joint win. Their pilot commercial is by far the funniest and the most well thought out. And Nina and Valentina are in the bottom two with their pilot being the kind of train wreck you just can't look away from. It was absolute chaos in both the best and the worst way possible. And then we get the moment that pretty much defines this entire season, Mask Gate. I realized later after thinking, hmm, why did I think Valentina did better this season than she actually did? Well, it's because I think the show needed to prop her up as this huge threat to then make her elimination even more shocking. Don't get me wrong, Valentina had a solid run, but I kind of remember her having like a willow pill one with, you know, getting one challenge win but being in the top every other week. In reality, she won episode two and then only had two other weeks in the top. Valentina is one of the best queens ever cast on this show, especially when it comes to the entertainment factor that she brings. Even just watching her on All Stars 4, where she's really not like slaying the competition, she was still the most entertaining and fun queen to tune into every single week. She just makes good TV, and this greedy moment is proof of that. Also, side note, if Ariana's label is dumb enough to not release Greedy as a single, I'm glad it's still forever cemented in gay history because of this episode. Like, Valentina really did that for us. So, we get what I guess is pointed to us as the front runner of the competition being sent home, and we go into the top six makeover challenge, which is a hilarious one where they have to make over crew members. The way Nina is treated in this episode, it never quite sat right with me. I, I can't help but think maybe Nina wouldn't have completely given up this episode if the other queens just let her vent and heard her out. But it's pretty obvious now that Nina is a very nuanced person. I mean, she's had scandals and, and all of that, but what's clear from everything is that she's someone who's been through a lot. She struggles with her mental health, and maybe this kind of environment isn't the best place for her to flourish. The queens shutting down her negativity the way they constantly do, I don't know, policing the feelings of a grown-ass adult, it just didn't sit right with me. And the way they all bash her in the confessional. I mean, this is all kind of a tangent, but this is her elimination episode. So the big question of this episode is who deserved to win, Sasha or Trinity? Trinity gets her third win here. And this would have been Sasha's first solo win, third win overall, if she had won. Genuinely, I don't think it's rigged that Trinity won. Sasha, I think, made the cardinal mistake of the makeover challenge, which is outshining your partner. Giving herself this stunning, fitted look while her makeover partner is wearing a hefty bag for a dress. I'm not sure the color blocking works on her makeover partner. For all in all, Sasha looks a million times better than her makeover partner did. Trinity, I also think looks better than her makeover partner, but I don't think she was going to get her makeover partner to be basically naked like she was on the runway. And he still looked pretty good in the bathing suit that she put him in. I don't know. Either of them could have won in my eyes. I'd be like, sure, whatever, it's fine. But I don't think the show purposely was taking away a win from Sasha and giving it to someone who doesn't deserve it. The queen who I do think kind of gets unfair critiques in this episode is Alexis Michelle. She's put in the bottom three over Peppermint. So, like, sure, Alexis's looks are a little basic, but her partner looks great. Like, it's fine. Peppermint fully didn't get put in the bottom three because of Wintergreen and how much they all adored her because there is no resemblance between them and Wintergreen's look is absolutely horrible. 
I think just at this point, Peppermint is more likable and already had a few bottom placements. So throwing Alexis into the bottom is better than making Pep's track record worse at this point. We finally get to see the Nina versus Shay lip sync smackdown of the century, which isn't really that exciting because Nina gives up and is nowhere near as good of a lip sync as we know Shay can give now. Also, still mad they didn't give them a Kesha song since she was the guest judge. I'm trying to remember, have we ever had a Kesha lip sync? No, I don't think we have. That's fucked up. Give the Queens literally any song from Warrior and it would be iconic. Let's talk about Shea Coulee. Four challenge wins and no crown. If they had kept the old format of the show, she 1000% would have won. She would have been our winner and Sasha would have come back and won all stars. But the crappy lip syncs on the season had other things in mind. Shay is just one of those girls who you know is a superstar from the second they walk into the workroom. From her amazing promo, iconic entrance line, and hot dog look all before even episode 2, I think we all knew she was going to be a force to be reckoned with in this competition. It's so weird watching little Shay this season. I mean, she's grown into such a superstar. It's weird to go back and see her before everything that she's achieved now. Shay's main storyline of the season is very much tied to others, though. Her frenemyship with Nina, her working and friendly relationship with Sasha. We get to learn about Shay, but much of it is through her interactions with other queens. Whereas we get way more personal content and storylines from Peppermint Trinity and Sasha. Shay is just kind of the powerhouse. She sends home Nina in the lip sync, and the next two episodes before the finale, she just kind of continues to devour the competition before the finale where it all comes crumbling down. The ball is the next episode. It's the gay ball. And it's another episode that people feel Sasha was robbed of winning. And another instance where I feel like it's not blatant riggery. I feel like Sasha and Shay both did well this episode. If either of them won, I'd be like, sure. But I will say... I absolutely hated Sasha's final look that she made herself, so I was happy to see Shay take it in her iconic construction worker look. The bottom two this week are Peppermint and Alexis, which makes sense since this is a look challenge and those are the two queens who struggled the most with fashion throughout the season. Trinity gets some harsher critiques that lead to her being bottom three instead of top three, which is where I think she belonged. But Peppermint delivers another iconic lip sync and Alexis is sent home. And now we're left with our final four, which is who I consider the strongest final four in Drag Race history. All we need now is Peppermint to come back and get a crown and all four of them will be winners. It needs to happen. I refuse to accept anything else. The category is episode is so iconic. They all do an amazing job with their verses and performances, with Shay's still being what I consider to be the greatest verse in any Rumix challenge ever. It's been revealed at this point that they filmed an ending where Peppermint was cut and the other three go on to the finale, which does make sense since Peppermint had the weakest track record of the four by far, but instead they went with the ending where they all make it to the finale and we get what I consider to be the greatest drag race finale of all time. But not before we get the most iconic reunion of all time, which I am making a video about in the next few weeks. I cannot wait to dissect this. It deserved to be a challenge with these placements and you can't tell me anything otherwise. Lip sync for the crown. One of the only two times I think it truly worked. This was so iconic. Time stopped when this finale first aired. It was such a good idea, maybe outdated now, but for the time, it was exactly the kind of injection of energy the finales needed. Finales were so boring before, and this made sure that it was something you wanted to tune in for. After Charlie, Nina, Cynthia, Farah, and Valentina all had contributed to lackluster lip syncs, this felt like the show making up for the fact that they only had like three solid lip syncs throughout the entire season. We know now that the show did not give the final four queens much time to prepare all of their looks, 
but that they did ask them to prepare reveals and make it as grandiose as possible. Well, that's pretty hard to do in like a week, which is why Sasha's reveals were so iconic because they didn't require a designer to create, you know, this intricate look that all comes apart. It was just shit shoved into her, her gloves and her wig or a mask that just came apart. The unfortunate timing of the passing of Shay's father and sister led to her not really being in the creative or focused headspace needed for this type of performance. So seeing her get beat by Sasha really was sad since she was the front runner of the entire season. No queen who had won four challenges had ever lost the season until now. And on the other end, Peppermint comes in with an incredible reveal and lip sync, taking out the other front runner of the competition. Coming in, I think a lot of people expected the winner to be either Trinity or Shay. Shay had the best track record, but Trinity had the best storyline. Peppermint and Sasha never felt like priorities to producers. So the fact that they ended up being in the final two is honestly iconic. And now that Shay and Trinity both have crowns, it's like, okay, cool, everything is right with the world. So let's talk about our winner, finally, Sasha Velour. We had queens like Yada Sophia and Milk and Acid Betty pushing the boundaries of what drag could be for those watching at home. But Sasha took it to a whole other level. From her bald head, her unibrow, blurring the gender lines in her looks, she was showing off a style of drag we had never seen before on the show because it was all tied up in a very theatrical, avant-garde, almost Baroque style. People like to diminish her wins because they were both joint wins, but I find that so stupid. Who cares if she won them with someone else? She still did the damn thing too, having never been in the bottom two, and her only low placement being because she was just the least good. She had such an amazing performance on the show, serving different kinds of looks that showed her wide range, performing well in a lot of different types of challenges, look challenges, comedy challenges, improv challenges, creative challenges. She really showed that she is the full package, especially in this finale where we finally got to see her lip sync and we realized she performs in a way we have never seen on this show up to this point. Sasha Velour truly busted open the doors that so many before her have been cracking open a little wider and wider. But with being such a huge fan favorite, I think the show realized that the audience was open to other styles of drag at, that they weren't used to seeing on the show. Which, you know, they should have realized years before when, like, Milk was such a huge fan favorite. But, I mean, like, screw it. It had less to do with what viewers thought and more about what the judges and the producers were open to. Let's not forget the critiques that Milk got on her season. They were much harsher than anything she got from the fan base. Sasha is an amazing queen. This is an amazing season. Of all the seasons I've covered, this is by far the least rigged one. I think all the rigging on the season was less to push a certain queen and more so to make the most dramatic and intriguing television that they could. Now, all of this would change just the very next season, which is considered one of the most rigged seasons of the show. But something about watching this season and not ending every episode like fuming with contempt over the decisions made really makes the experience even better. I'm excited to continue to go back and do these older seasons. I know ones like Seven are pretty high and riggery, but I wonder if there are others that I don't think of as being, you know, really rigged that I'll rewatch and realize that they were rigged to high hell. So tell me, what do you think is the most rigged moment of season nine? Did I catch all of the moments? Did I miss any? I want to know all of your thoughts. As always, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. We're going to have a couple more Season 9 related videos. We're going to do, of course, the What If It Wasn't Rig. We're going to do a look at the reunion where I dissect all of it. So we're going to stay in this realm for a little bit. I'm excited. Also, UK4 has begun. And if you want to hear my thoughts on it, you can check it out on my Patreon with my new Rigged Recap podcast featuring Bootsy, where we are going to break down every episode of UK4 that is at the $5 tier on my Patreon. So go check that out. I want to thank all of my beautiful patrons, especially Crimson, Jack, Ryan, and Seth, who are signed up on my newest tier. I appreciate you guys so much. 
Thank you all so much for watching. The links to all my social media are here. The links to my merch are in the description below. And I think you can actually buy it through YouTube now, which is great. Make sure to check out my Instagram because we're going to be running all kinds of polls on UK4 that I will then use for my videos when I eventually have to make the riggery of UK4. So I'm very excited for that. Cool. I think that's everything. I appreciate you all so much. Stan... Sasha Valor, stand like Lily, everyone on this cast. All right, I will see you all in the next one.